If you're thinking of keeping poultry but don't know where to start, coming up, we'll share some things for you to consider. Before you make the plunge, we want to give you some things to think about. Now, I know it's happened to me. I don't, I'm not going to tell you how many times, but I go into the feed store and they've got all these tubs of baby chicks or brooders full of baby chicks and man, they are hard to resist, but please do so because you really need to think through this whole poultry keeping hobby before you jump into it. For example, Set your goals. What what do you want your birds to do for you? Why are you keeping poultry? Are you wanting them for eggs? And, you know, how many birds would you need to have to feed to your family? Well, for a family of four, you want about four, maybe five females, and that will give you plenty of eggs and some extras to share with friends and family. Do you want to raise birds for meat? Well, you need to know how many times a week does your family eat chicken? Two or three times a week, or maybe once a week, or maybe once every two weeks. So what about both? Can you have yeah, birds that do what, both? What about both? Yeah, well, there's birds that will do both, and, and we call those dual-purpose breeds. They lay a good number of eggs, although they're not as productive as your egg layers uh, that are bred specifically for that. They also have bigger bodies than your normal egg layers like leggings, and that will give you a reasonable amount of meat when you process them particularly the male. Does, does that make them harder to raise or less efficient? doesn't make them harder to raise. Um, it will make them less efficient than your uh, egg laying breed just because their bodies are larger. You can look at egg layers and pick them out because they're typically smaller bodied. Their bodies are more rectangular in shape. Uh, dual purpose breeds uh, have larger bodies and it's starting to become a more box like shape more square and then you get down into your meat breeds uh, those birds have uh, very square bodies and they're very heavy so the bigger the body like cinder block on legs exactly right uh, the bigger the body the more it's going to cost you to feed them just bear that in mind or maybe you want to keep exhibition birds yeah you've uh, maybe been to a poultry show at your county fair or your state fair and you were really impressed with a whole variety of breeds and different color varieties. Uh, and it really is an impressive thing. It's a hobby that I've been involved in since I was mm, about 18, 19 years old. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun, but it is a lot of work because one of the things to remember right off top, there's what I call the rule of 10. That is for every 10 birds you raise to maturity, you will get one that is good enough to keep just one. If you raise a hundred birds, you'll get 10 and that's either good enough to show or good enough to use to move your flock forward in a breeding program. And that's, that's from a very well-bred group to begin with. Yes. I mean, if you're starting with hatchery stock, uh, maybe one in 200 or one in 300. Very I wouldn't so. start with hatchery stock, but I've tried to, and I've experienced the frustration of trying to. And, it's uh, very difficult because exhibition birds are bred to a written standard, not only for color, but for what we call type or body shape. Now, your hatchery birds are not bred to a written standard, and that's one of the primary differences between hatchery and exhibition birds. Exhibition birds, it can be hard to find a start in those birds and requires a lot of searching and research and, and a relationship building on your part to, to get good ones. Even finding a breeder who you, you can convince that they want to sell you some of their stock. Well, that goes back to building the relationship. It, it certainly uh, does. It, uh, it can be hard to, to walk up to John Smith at a show and say, no, John Smith's probably going to roll his eyes and look at you like, I don't know you. I don't want to know. I don't know if I want to trust my genetics in your hands or not. I want to know that you're going to be able to not only take care of the birds, but breed them properly and move them forward. And have that breeder's name associated with them. Correct. In the future, too. Correct. Uh, so what about, I've heard at shows that after the shows or even during the shows, there's a lot of birds for sale and for auction. Most shows today have a 
section set aside for sale birds. Okay. But the thing you got to remember, those birds are in that sale area because they were a breeder's culls. Okay. Okay. Now that's not to say they're all bad birds because that's certainly not the case. They're just birds that he didn't want to keep in his flock to breed from or to show for, with. Are there breeders? I mean, do people like win ribbons at shows and then sell the bird immediately there? There's a bird. So I'll just go from personal experience. Okay. I had a bird uh, that was champion of the show, overall champion, Rhode Island Red Pullet. And there was a lady there that was really enamored with that pullet. And she, she offered to buy her. And I thought, no, I think I want to keep her. And the more I thought about it, uh, the more I thought, you know, she'll not only give that bird a good home, she'll do something with it. So before we left, I just called her over and I said, hey, look, you know, I, I like you. I think you'll do the right things by these birds. So just go pick that bird up and take it home with you. I didn't sell it. I just gave it away. I, I've given away more birds than I've ever sold in my life. Oof. Yes. But well, I like, I like to think of it as genetic preservation. Um, exactly. Stash, I'm stashing some genetics with some people that I trust. Exactly. That's, that's, that's the way I look at it. And I know that's the way a lot of other breeders of standard bred poultry look at it. And hopefully that's the way I, our listeners will look at it too. After listening to the show, sure. another reason that poultry are kept and that's for preservation breed preservation there's a lot of rare breeds out there uh, that are desperately in need of help uh, red caps come to mind uh, lamonas come to mind but they they need folks who are dedicated and willing to work with them but with preservation breeding you have to maintain a lot of birds i mean this is not something you can do with a trio or something you can do with two trios. I mean, we're talking two or 300 birds in a flock. And you're doing open flock mating in this. Most of the time you're doing open flock mating. Uh, There's times when you would resort to other breeding techniques, but you want to keep that genetic diversity and, and uh, the diversity up. So Mm. open flock mating is is the best for doing that. It's hard to make progress with them, but. (laughs) <laughs> so let's suppose that somebody got some super rare birds like a uh, old English pheasant fowl um, that, uh, you know, you're starting off with five birds mm-hmm. because they're so five birds is, is there enough genetic diversity there? Do, cause we don't know how they were bred before they got to me. And we don't know how they were bred before they left England two years ago. If you breed your birds, right? Yes. There's a good book out on the market uh, called Starting Where You Are With What You Have, mm-hmm. uh, written by Ralph Sturgeon. I, I knew Ralph, and he has been he passed away several decades ago now, sadly. But he was a master breeder. <laughs> and if you follow the directions or, or the suggestions in his book, you can do it. Uh, I maintained uh, my family of Rhode Island Reds or I should say my strain of Rhode Island Reds for many, many years. They had been bred for close to 90 years by the time I got out of them. Uh, 90 years with no outside blood being brought in. So you can do it. You just have to learn how. This is not something that is easy for the newcomer to, to comprehend or to start out doing. Not trying to discourage everybody, but it's just a fact of life. Right. Well, this this is a very specific preservation and conservation type question, which I definitely want to cover in more detail later in the series. Yeah, and, and we. But can... the average person starting out, you know, as you said, they're they're either going to take their time and do their research, or find a local mentor who's going to take them under their wing, or they're going to come home with a dozen chicks and the all you need in a uh, a stock tank package from Tractor Supply and an impulse buy. That's kind of how we get our new poultry people, one of those ways. Yes. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of people keeping poultry in the United States. And I would be willing to bet you that 90% of them started that that very way. I know uh, I did. So Yes. Yes. If there's a mistake to be made, uh, you know, I did it. You know, before uh, I started taking poultry classes in college, uh, 
you know, I figured, well, let's just see what does well here. So I ordered two of this and two of that and two of that. So I had, you know, 14 birds of seven different varieties. And I thought that's going to tell me what I need to know and which variety I should grow here. And all it did was confuse the heck out of me. <laughs> and it was hatchery stock. So I don't think it was an accurate representation of what we can expect from the breed. But, and, and I know we're sitting here talking really serious stuff. But the beauty of what you did and what I did, we learned a lot with that first impulse buy. We got into the basics of caring, breeding, managing those birds. And that's how a lot of us started, no doubt about it. And folks, if you're listening and you're thinking about getting into poultry, you can do it too. Yes, I think it's usually around about the second year when your birds hit their first molt. And they stop laying is when the, the new poultry keeper starts thinking, okay, I got a couple of months off. Uh, do I really want to do this? And I, I see a lot of equipment that's right at 18 to 24 months yes. old for sale on the various marketplaces. Well, John, we've talked about goals for keeping poultry, but I know I live in Florida. You live in Vermont. We have two very widely divergent Completely types. Completely of- different. Yes, completely different geographical influences. I'm at 1,800 feet of elevation. Uh, We have a week or two every winter where it's negative 30 Fahrenheit before the wind chill is factored in. Um, That the that affects a lot uh, as far as just the flock that I want, the breeds that are going to be in it, where I place my coop in relation to wind breaks and wind rows. Uh, but also it has a huge impact on uh, feed considerations. What what the local feed supply is in my area. Do I only have the local big box store and, you know, tote home 50 pound bags? Or could I possibly start getting some raw ingredients and mixing in some oats and wheat and uh, barley and all those other, you know, whole grains? Um, you know, we'll definitely get into diet and nutrition later, but that's that's where I'd like to be able to move to. But not uh, not everybody has that option sometimes the only thing you have is lowe's or home depot or tractor supply or western auto or what are the big chains down south that everybody goes to for feed uh we have a a kind of small chain here called rural king okay uh they have a reasonable uh, feed available there and it's usually pretty economically priced but you got to learn to read the tags though another Hold another show, and we'll get That's into right. that coming up before too much yeah. longer. Let's just put this out there. Don't go shopping by price tag. Learn to at least look at the tags when you're making your buying. Yes. What about, and and I know you had to deal with these kind of things when you were deciding on what breeds you wanted to, to raise, but does body size impact the birds up in Vermont? I know um, it's down here. Well, if the birds start getting overweight, um, they're just not healthy to begin with, and they're going to have a real hard time with the heat. Uh, so there is that. So keeping the birds in good physical condition, uh, I think, is more important than the overall body size. I've got some Chanticleers, which were bred up in Oka, Quebec, Canada, about 14 kilometers across the border from me. Uh, and they're, they're pretty good size. At 18 weeks, they're pushing six and a half pounds live weight. Um, they don't like the heat. It's currently 92 degrees out, and which is very rare for this time of year up here. And they just look like they've melted into a puddle in their favorite little hole that they've dug in the ground. Um, but on the flip side, they're fantastic in the winter. Uh, they have no combs. They have no wattles. So that affects their ability to perspire and give get rid of excess heat in the, the summer. But in the winter, I don't have to worry about frostbite, um, which is a genuine concern. I mean, it's... It, it's sad to see the birds in pain like that. People say it doesn't hurt them, but I've, I've picked them up and I've tried putting some salve on them and the way that they've, you yeah. know, kind of reacted. I know that they're in pain and I don't like yes. that. Yes. It's um, one, one thing that I want to mention here is that different breeds of poultry were developed for different purposes and they were all for specific regions. I just started to say they were developed to perform well in that region because when the, a lot of our breeds were developed, folks didn't have 
uh, much income, so they kept chickens and they sold eggs. They sold processed poultry. And if those birds didn't perform well where they lived, they didn't keep them. That's the bottom line. Um, an, hey, another when thing. was it that the U.S. Postal Service started shipping eggs? That, oh, might, be a good, that might be a good topic to look at. I would have to look that one up. Because that really did transform the industry. Early on, it was a railroad express agency that shipped uh, eggs and birds. Okay. Uh, I've got several birds that came in by train to my location yeah. because you couldn't ship them by mail like you can now. But I don't recall exactly when baby chicks started being mailed. I have to look that up. We'll, we'll share that with our listeners on, a, on another show. Another thing that was the feather type. How does that affect the birds that you would evaluate up in your area? Well, for, for my area, I want uh, really dense um, under feathers down. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm having a, a brain cramp. Uh, and I want thick, wiry feathers on the outside that are going to protect against wind and driving rain and sleet and hail. Uh, my birds insist on being out in all weather. I can't keep them inside when it's negative 30 uh, because they just get downright ornery. They want to be outside. Well, they so, were bred for that. They, they were. Uh, they're fine with it. They love to eat snow. If I put fresh, warm water out on a warm poultry fountain plate mm -hmm. they first thing in the morning they come out they don't go for the water they go and peck at the snow and eat snow <laughs> i didn't teach them that i mean this this was a complete uh cut over these birds had zero contact with anything else on the farm it was like a 90 day zero bird period here mm -hmm. um i wanted to see what they naturally knew out of the shell one thing that people get into down in the South, they see these heavily feathered birds like Cochins, uh, Orpingtons, just really profusely feathered birds. And then sadly, they get into these birds. And then when the summer temperature here, mm. it's the El Scorcho mark on, on the thermometer. They start having problems with birds actually dying from heat stress. So if you have hot temperatures, you want to stay away from those breeds, if you possibly can, that have long, profuse feathers. And I, I know uh, I, I know somebody that had uh, English Orpington, and she was very proud of the, the fact that they had 13-inch long feathers. And that blew me away. I, I couldn't imagine a bird with 13-inch long feathers. And these were feathers off the breast area. These were not like tail feathers or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. That um, helped the but but they're are, but they're down. Do they have a lot of yes capacity for airflow under there, or is that thick no. and tight as well? It, it's very thick. As wow. a matter of fact, um, one lady that I'm aware of, and I'm certainly not going to mention any names, had birds that were dying, and she finally resorted to clipping about half the feathers, the lower half of the bird's body, completely off to cool help them cool down. Well, last year, um, my. Uh, black Australorps. I was observing them in my front yard and it was one of the very few days that it gets above 90 here in Vermont. And one of the old gals, she was about four years old, was kind of limping along a little lethargically and she was heading for the waterer and I had a sprinkler going and she went underneath the sprinkler to get there. And I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. And she literally got to the water, dipped her beak in twice and then fell over. And I did a necropsy on it and it, it was a heart attack. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was sad because, but, you know, she was old and her entire life, she had not been exposed to that heat. That was the first time she saw above 90 degrees. Heat can really wreak havoc on a flock if you're not prepared to deal with it. I think so, it's worse than cold. It is. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Posed, and what's the old, the old um, process of, to protect? Dubbing. From? Yeah. So apparently I can take these breeds that are susceptible to frostbite and dub them and then relieve that sensitivity a little bit. But the sad part about dubbing and removing, you know, the comb and the wattles and the earlobes, that's the, that's, that can cause that's problems the radiator. because that's a radiator to get rid of body heat, you know, when it gets hot and if they don't have a comb and they don't have wattles, man, they can suffer from the heat. 
So the bird that I dubbed to protect it from frostbite when we're at negative 30 is probably going to have some real problems on the other end when we hit above 90 here because it can't yes. dissipate enough body heat. Well, they don't sweat like people do, you know. Uh, to get rid of the heat, they depend on the comb, the wattles, and they can also pant, and that will help alleviate some of the body heat. But uh, heat is a big stressor to you have to worry about. So much to think about with geographical influence. Yes. I think it's probably the single biggest uh, factor that people should consider when selecting a bird, making sure that it's properly suited for the environment. I would agree with that. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you know, an, another thing that people need to decide right up front, are you going to keep poultry in a linear fashion or are you going to keep them in a cyclical fashion? And by lineal, I mean, you buy the chicks, you raise them up, they lay eggs, they hit about 18 months to 24 months of age. Their egg production is pretty well over with. Uh, you're not going to get very many eggs from them, so you can either process them or, or pass them along to somebody else. But to get started, you got to go all the way back and start to process over with another, another batch of chicks. Now, mm -hmm. That style of poultry keeping is not sustainable. Uh, usually the birds that are, are maintained in this lineal poultry keeping process are hybrids. And so hybrid, if you don't know, is where they've crossed two different breeds of birds to produce uh, a bird that is a little more productive, lays more eggs, maybe it gets larger. And in some of these strains, uh, and John and I were talking about this before we started recording this show, but there's 16 generations that go into producing that chick you buy at the store. The parent stock, you've got the grandparent stock, you've got the great, great parent stock and so on. I'm, it's amazing the amount of effort that goes into right. those chicks. And these are all held under very strict biosecurity and genetic yep. security conditions because at each layer of the genetics, it's usually a different owner. Mm -hmm. And they then they will, you know, contribute their piece and, you know, keep their flock going. And but that's also how they can, um, you know, ensure heterosis and this hybrid vigor and production. Yes. So there is a lot of science that goes into it, but it's out of the scope of most home breeders. Absolutely. I, I would not. Oh, I, I. I don't even want to think about what it would take to maintain. Parent lines going back so many generations it's yeah. it's scary it, it's not too bad if you have two small uh heritage uh flocks uh, and then you can cross them together for a little heterosis bump but i still consider that a genetic dead end i would not try to breed those they're not going to be true no no no, no mandel is going to have uh some some real fun there in the punnett square as far <laughs> as expression which is great fun to to see now, yes. you know if you want to start doing some farmyard science Genetics is a fascinating thing that I know just enough about to be really dangerous, but uh, it, it, it can teach you a lot about birds. The, you know, we talked about linear poultry keeping, and the other thing I mentioned was cyclical poultry keeping, and that's the type of poultry keeping that I'm involved in. I know that's the type of keeping uh, poultry keeping that uh, John is practicing, but it starts out with breeding, and then hatching, and then rearing, and then going through and selecting the best birds, and starting the process all over again next year. So it goes in a cycle. These are usually done with standard bred poultry because they are sustainable. If you breed them uh, to each other, you can get the same bird uh, to hatch out. That, that's one of the requirements of being uh, in the considered a standard bred bird is that it breeds true yes it's um the the one thing that really upsets me and gets my angst going is when i see people that are they're not really breeding they're just multiplying they take a rooster and a bunch of hens they throw them together with no concern about trying to improve the breed or maintain the quality that they have and they practice this philosophy over and over and over again. And all they're in it for is to make money off the birds. And they pass them off 
sadly, many times there's something that they're not. You know, these are from show quality wines. Well, they mm -hmm. might have been seven or you eight can generations. Make money off of birds? Yeah, well, I'll okay. tell you how to become a millionaire keeping poultry. Start with two. No, start out as a billionaire. Uh, and you, you'll you find these folks offering birds on eBay and, and some of these sites like that and or hatching eggs. And if you find out they're keeping seven or eight different breeds, you can pretty well guess that they're not working to improve any one breed. I got my start through the Livestock Conservancy, and they have a good online resource for finding people who have qualified stock. Where yeah. else can people look? There are specific breed groups on Facebook, uh, like Rhode Island Reds or Bress, although it's not a recognized breed uh, here in America. They are a fantastic uh, dual purpose breed. There's clubs for clubs for Plymouth Rocks. Uh, just almost any. Well, there's breed. a club for everything. Yes. Yes. It's just uh, finding the breed that you want and joining the club, or actually get a couple of breeds in mind and join a couple of different clubs, and you know just lurk in the background and listen to what people have to say about birds. Well, a another good place is the American Poultry Association. You know you can. Join the American, the American Poultry Association. You'll hear us refer to it often as the APA, but that's we mean American Poultry Association. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one of the cool things about becoming a member is that each year you will get this huge yearbook, and it's chock full of ads and a few articles. But if you're searching for breeds, that for standard bred breed is the place to go to look, is the American Poultry Association's annual yearbook. Okay. Yeah, I get that um, every year, and I, I look at the pictures, to be honest with you, because there's some beautiful pictures in there. Yes, beautiful birds. Beautiful birds, beautiful birds. Inspiring. Um, yeah. You know. I, I so think, this breeding cycle that you're talking about, yeah. I mean, it just, when does it end, or does it end? When, oh, you know, I'm having a problem with my flock. I need to refresh in the blood. No. No. Okay. No. That's, but let's uh, put that myth to rest right now. If you do it <laughs> properly, if so you're many, breeding, if you're breeding your birds properly, how many birds do you need? How many birds do, do you need? Three trios. So nine birds. Nine birds as foundation stock, or you call it breeding stock? Is breeding stock as foundation and breeding stock? The way I started, I got uh, with a guy who had probably the best Rhode Island Reds around, at least in my locale anyway, in south southeastern U.S. I got six females that were pin sisters. They were all related. I got three males that complemented those females, and by complemented, where the females had a weak point, the males were had a strong point. All right. Okay. So but you're I bringing made, up something called compensation mating. I am. Okay. Um, and that's a whole other story. Uh, yes, sir. Too. Let's, let's put a little check in the box for that. So we're going <laughs> to loop back around there. But I made sure the males were not related to the females that they were being bred to. So how closely do you want them separated when you start this process? In the same family, one, two, three generations, cousins, from nephews? The same breeder, from the same breeder. Uh, Mr. Reese, who I got my Rhode Island red from had 10 different family lines that he maintained. If I remember correctly, the females I got were out of his family number four. And I got a male from family one, a male from family six and a male from family two, I think, but they were not related to the female. Right. No, they, he turned me loose in a pen of about mm, 200 females. And he said, pick out the six you want. So I spent several hours going through to get the six females that I wanted because I knew I wanted them all related. I, it was, that pretty much ate up that day. <laughs> and I'm sure I, he was looking on with great. Oh yeah. Interest. He was right there. And it, there was three or four that I picked out. He said, no, I want to keep that one. Well, that's, that's a glowing endorsement for your eye. And when he then says, no, you was, can't have that one. There was a couple that I picked out and he says, I'm going to let you have that one, but with reservations. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I let a, a quad go to a friend of mine up the road, and she was just delighted to get these Chanticleers because they're just impossible to find. And I just told her, you know, you've got one rooster and you've got three hens. All I want is two dozen eggs when they're 32 weeks old. And that's a good way to do it. You know, if if you're maintaining your bloodlines yourself, but if you've also got what I like to refer to as satellite flocks, of other people maintaining your birds, it's very easy to go back to them when you need to blood if you don't have what you need. So, and everybody in the neighborhood benefits. Absolutely. Um, and we we could actually, if anybody doesn't have the space to start housing multiple families for breeding, I could have a flock at my neighbor across the street, a flock at my neighbor up the sure. road, and actually sure. do my rooster rotations. Just pick up this rooster and drive him down the street, and pick up this rooster and drive him down the street, and just rotate around like that. They don't necessarily have to be in the same place. Not at all. Not at all. As long as you, you know, you're very cognizant of biosecurity. Absolutely. I, I do very highly qualify. I don't, I don't consider them my customers. They're more like custodians and partners in the process. Oh, sure. That, if I, if I get an email from somebody on the internet, it's like, Hey, I heard you breed this, you know, variety. I'd be interested in getting some eggs. One of the very first things I ask them for is, can you send me a picture of your poultry setup as it is now? It'll give mm -hmm. me an idea of where you are in your process. Um, and it'll also give me an idea of whether my birds are going to thrive in your environment. Yes, exactly. This concludes part one of Getting Started with Poultry. We'll be sharing more information on this topic in our next episode. In the meantime, if you have any comments, suggestions, or questions, Shoot us an email at poultrykeeperspodcast at gmail.com. Poultrykeeperspodcast at gmail.com. We'll have more great information for you next time on the Poultry Keepers Podcast. Until then, remember, keep your birds scratching and pecking. We'll talk to you in the next episode, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you.